essentially, this is the session on the ACL. So if you wanted to know about ACL, it's, this is like a constellation of stars with the lecturers that you're going to see in front of you till lunchtime. So this is a feast of excitement. Um, we're, going to, we're going to introduce the lecturers. We're going to go through the lectures and then have some questions at the end. I would remind the lecturers that I'm sitting next to Jonathan Mad Dog Lavelle, um, who will bite anyone's ankles who goes over eight minutes. Um, so we'll keep our lectures the time, but look forward to discussion uh, after that, um, after the series of lectures. Jonathan, shall we introduce the first patient, as it were? First patient? Yes, the first patient. <laughs> right, so we're going to start off with um, a session with Nikki Phillips, who's going to start off with, with um, discussion about whether reconstruction is always necessary. It may be if she's convincing enough that the, uh, that will be it. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I did think when I was given this title, and I saw the session, and I saw the speakers, the idea of putting a physio up first to, in front of a load of orthopaedic surgeons to say, do you really need surgery, if ever there was a hospital pass. Thank you very much for that. Um, we've got to put this declaration. There's no financial or no financial um, interest that I need to disclose. Coming on to really what I need to talk about. Um, when you look at the literature, I think it's really polarised, and it's not just the literature, it's opinions. Um, you're either very much against surgery or very much for surgery, it seems, um, the people that write about it and the people that stand up and talk about it quite a bit. And it's, it can be quite divisive. One of the things I think is important to mention when you start to look at the papers is when they say reconstruction, they're actually talking about early reconstruction. And when they're talking about non-surgical, they're actually quite often talking about the option of delayed reconstruction. And that puts some of those papers into context a little bit. I've pulled out a couple of papers really just to set the scene that might link up to some discussion that I'm going to come back to a few times later. So if, if we look on the side for reconstruction or early reconstruction, one of the papers I pulled out um, was looking at a 15-year follow-up study and saying little difference in OA changes at 15 years. Now, you might think, that doesn't really support surgery because there's little difference. But then when you start to look at some of the other things, um, the surgical patients came out slightly better on the lies home, um, and they had less meniscal injuries, and for me, I think that's key. Um, the th a third of the non-surgical group were reconstructed later. And again, that is a, is a common thing that you start to see in some of the other the papers. Another editorial, so it's not research, but came out with this, um, the decision about management should be individualised. I think that's a no-brainer as well, but I'm going to come back to that as to why I think that's important. And it was quite a nice piece, I think, as, a, as an editorial, pulling things together. Another one I thought was quite interesting, because this is one of the arguments against surgery a little bit, is that it actually turned out to be quite cost-effective in terms of long-term care. Um, that was quite a complex when you start to look at the analysis that they did on that, but I think worthy of looking at. Coming on to the other side, I think the big papers, the big research group that's received a lot of attention are the, the Frobel group, um, and this is just two of the papers I've put there. There are lots more um, with a different mix of authors and different lead authors. So this is some of the ones that's caused the big fuss, really, and where they're saying there's no significant difference between immediate and the key optional delayed um, reconstruction surgery. Um, and I'll come back to that in a bit more detail later because I think that's worthy of talking about. But another thing I wanted to add into this side is Clara Dern's work. And again, there's quite a lot of um, papers on this with the same group of authors, where she came to the conclusion that 33% of the cohort that they looked at um, went back to competitive sport after reconstruction. So again, it's a negative thing about reconstruction going on the side of non-surgical. I think that very much links to the session that was before, where you heard about those professional footballers and what it actually takes psychologically and the resilience that they need to actually go back, the hours of work that they need to do to go back to the sport, um, and that tenacity to stick at a programme. I think the mistake sometimes happens is that these people are high profile, 
they have a reconstruction, it's all in the media, they go back to their sport. And so Joe Bloggs down the road says, oh, well, he had a reconstruction, that's going to be magical, I'm going to go back to sport. And without really thinking through the amount of work that they're going to have to do afterwards. And maybe that's why you don't see quite as many going back to that higher level competitive sport after. Come back to that Frobel study. Um, some of the things I think are worth pointing out with it. So the people that were in the optional delayed surgical group, at two years, 40% had actually had a reconstruction that were in that group. By five years, over 50% had had a reconstruction of some description. Um, and there were more meniscal procedures needed in, during that follow-up period in that non-surgical group. The early reconstructions had better stability on Lachman's, whether you think how important that is or not at that stage. Um, there was more patellofemoral OA um, in the patella tendon ones compared to the hamstring, so it's not between surgical and non-surgical. might be looking at um, the choice of surgery. Um, and key again, there were lower numbers of repeat meniscal surgery. But of all that, the things that make me think about it with caution they talk about the patient reported measures and, you know, to be fair, they did, what, one, two, three, um, at least three, possibly four patient reported measures of some description. But have a think about those when you look at them in detail, the coups, when you look at the sport bit about coups, what they ask is, do you have difficulty in squatting, running, jumping, turning, twisting or kneeling? No, I don't do that. Can I go back and play Premier Division football? No, it doesn't actually distinguish that. The SF36 just asks about vigorous activities, like some of the things you can see listed there. The Tegna does actually try and distinguish between competitive and recreational sport, um, but it says, do you do competitive sport at least twice a week? So that doesn't actually distinguish between the one that can play on a Saturday, then can't walk downstairs Sunday, not able to train maybe on the Tuesday night. By Thursday night, they can have a run out with the team and then they can go back playing on the Saturday. That's playing competitive sport twice a week, but that's not really a good functional knee. So it's worth thinking about what these patient reported measures are, and if they are comparing some of those, we, we need to really think about it quite carefully. So we think, well, what else is important? If you do pre-op rehab, it seems to improve your outcomes. I'd say that's, that's again, really obvious. Um, it's worth thinking about with your average person that wants to go back to sport, the better you get them before the operation, the more likely they are to succeed. It's not really always feasible with a professional athlete because if you wait three months, that could waste another season by the time they get back and that could actually make the difference between whether they get back to that professional career or not. And then we're back to those concurrent meniscal injuries again and more predictive of outcome than actually the choice of whether it's surgery or not surgery. So whether they have meniscal problems is important and we're already seeing that the people that don't have surgery seem to have more meniscal problems. So if we look at some of the associated factors, I think of the three R's, rehab, resilience and readiness. Um, I would say rehab, I'm a physio. Um, but the strength measures, again, seem to be the thing that are indic indicative of outcome, regardless of what else you do to them. So strength is important. How, resili how resilient you are to get through that program, and you saw that with every one of those football players talked about what they needed to actually stick to it with all the setbacks and then pull themselves back up together and off they go again. So your average sports punter sometimes struggles with that. And then the psychological readiness, again, some of Clara Dern's work, where they're showing that these positive mental attitudes seem to improve the outcomes of people able to go back, regardless of whether they've had surgery or not. So again, we can't ignore some of those other factors. So if we think about that, can we really be prescriptive about everybody has an ACL reconstruction or everybody should wait? And I don't think that's possible. If you look at something like a professional rugby player, you know, it's like car crash, isn't it? They're banging into each other, it's proper collision injuries every day of the week, probably. Then you might have somebody who has a non-contact sport, um, doesn't turn, to jump, twist, pivot, um, but actually they're on skis on uneven ground, and if their knee goes awry there, then actually they could be dead by the time somebody's come to find them. So again, still fairly important, but very different needs. Netball players, 
um, they can actually wear some sort of bracing. So again, what we might do might be different. Surfers, lawn bowlers. How can you compare and say everybody should do all of that at once? So I think in summary to my little bit, I just want to say listen to that patient. Um, listen to what their needs are. Full recovery takes longer, regardless of what you do. Beware of that high-profile role mod model cited by recreational athletes. That sometimes is the bane of our lives. And beware the polarised views amongst experts. And uh, I certainly think one size doesn't fit all. Just about on time. Perfect. Thank you, Nick. That was very thought-provoking and on time, so double points. Um, so, moving on now, Tim Spalding, uh, well known to many of us, is going to talk about uh, ACL repair. Is there a role? So, moving through the spectrum now of ACL surgery. Thank you very much. So, I'm based at University Hospital Coventry and at uh, Fortius, and in my disclosures, then uh, related. Um, current chairman of the National Ligament Registry, which is therefore interested in outcomes for ACL reconstruction. So this is a controversial topic, and it's uh, no surprise with these two pictures, because some of the characters uh, doing ACL repair then are from America and from Scotland. And we hope that when we're faced with a new technique, and we look at that, and we're trying to make a decision as to what to do, that we hope we're going to come up with the ideal product that really does work and lasts the long time. So what are we really talking about? This is ACL repair, trying to reattach the ACL to the sidewall, proximal femoral injury, and not reconstructing it using hamstrings or another tendon. The problem here is that history said that this didn't really work. It was used a lot in the 70s and 80s, and then because of the unpredictable results, the technique got abandoned and replaced by the reconstruction. But now more has been learned about attention to detail with the location of that repair, and the argument the argument can be really quite persuasive, but we need the studies to back this up. In the recent journal of, uh, from, from Isikos, then this highlighted the historical aspect back in 1972, where John Fagan, who is a big name in the ACL world, published his initial results, but then after five years could report that most of them had then failed, 94% still having instability. So why doesn't this really heal, and what's the problem? And it's all really about the gap in the, from the ACL where it tears. So if you can obliterate that gap, then maybe you'll get primary healing. Whereas inside the knee, because of the fluid there, you don't get the clot, so we don't get the primary healing. And this was thought to be the, meal, the, the real main reason. So this sort of ACL, a complete lack of tissue, um, it will not heal by doing some primary repair. What's been recognized then that the proximal tears had a much better chance of a good outcome. And that was um, Sherman's work one from his analysis of the primary repairs, working out who did well. So we've got better technology now, better imaging, and different ways to repair it and doing it arthroscopic that weren't around those years ago. So what are the techniques? These are the three main ones. We've got primary reattachment of the tears using an anchor technology, holding the ACL back. We can augment it using a fiber tape device, which has been then labeled as an internal brace type technology. And then we can use other synthetic devices to, to hold the ligament in place. And I'm mainly going to be mentioning the first two. Alternatives, using hamstrings to feed through the ACL, this uh, single uh, antromedial bundle augmentation technique, or um, using then uh, augmenting a single bundle, taking one of the, the, the bundles hamstring or, or holding it back that way. Now, Greg DeFelice, who presented here two years ago, then has published a lot in the last couple of years on this. And this classification, the important part here, the type ones, this is recognizing where the uh, injury is a proximal pull-off from the femur, 6 or 10% in his experience. They're the ones that are suitable for this primary repair. Maybe augment those that are a little bit further down the ACL, but the mid-substance tears, those are not what we're talking about for primary repair. So some of those techniques and the results in, in the recent studies. Um, Greg has reported on his, this is in 2015, and he's reported again, this is 11 patients, one failure at that, at that time, and this is a technique repairing them the ACL to the lateral wall. And then just recently this year, he's reported on those patients no further failures. One has had a medial um, meniscal repair, but it's the same 11 that he's following up. 
What the te technique is then here on these, these pictures, first of all, identify this as a proximal tear where it's pulled off from the lateral wall. And we recognize that some of these tears may heal spontaneously anyway to account for those patients that cope well with their ACL injury. And then what he's, what he's doing is putting in sutures using this uh, scorpion suture passer, a, a number two tiger wire, a non-absorbable suture, and it's three to four passes, sorry the um, uh, red square has jumped a bit, but it's three to four passes through that area and then reattaching it back using two of these swivel lock suture anchors to hold it in place. That's one for each bundle. So quite a lot of suture and then two anchors. And then you can see here is this um, illustration how that holds it back in place. Brace for four weeks and then getting back to sport sometime after that, depending on the rehab program. Now this was a, a paper trying to look at the comparison, but this is a non-randomized study published December last year. And this is using a single suture anchor with microfracture stimulating some uh, healing from the side. And again, uh, looking at surgery within six weeks. So these are fresh tears within six weeks and a mean follow-up then of 28 months. But three failures in the repair group, not significantly different um, on their numbers and no, in the, no failures in the ACL reconstruction group. <coughs> The, the criticism here, yes, this is comparing to reconstruction. It's still short term, and it's a single anchor. Now, there was discussion on this, and uh, Greg DeFelice talks about his technique with a double anchor, and shown in research that he, after 100 cycles there, you only get a one millimeter gap. So he believes that the two anchors will hold it uh, better and have less of a gap, so we get this better healing. Now, this is, the, um, this is Gordon Mackay and his internal brace technology, which is again to put sutures in the ACL, but then using a suture tape. Now, it is actually a double loop of the suture tape. It's not a single strand of the tape that goes across the knee. It's folded and then held in, held in place. So this is then fed through the ACL, held back down into the tibia. So really, it's an augmentation repair device, bridging from the tibia to femur, these 3.5 millimeter tunnels and then fixing on a tightrope system on the femur along with the sutures and then a different anchor system on the lower end to hold it. Normal ACL rehab and sports specific training from 12 weeks. The results of this, there are a couple of articles out there. The latest one, the 68 pa uh, patients and he's had one failure in that time period. At the British Orthopaedic Association meeting just this month, then two year results in 42 patients Again, a consecutive series of his patients and two patients with three ruptures of that group at this time. Now, what Martha Murray's been doing in, in Boston is recognizing that there, there is this problem of the gap, and this is treating patients where there is a gap and using a scaffold to bridge across that area, and you may have um, read about this. So this is exciting work to try and create some form of healing to, to bridge across that gap. And there's been a lot of animal studies first, before then moving on to human studies with the first paper just looking at a three months assessment to report some of that outcome. But again, this is for when the ends cannot be um, approximated and this is the uh, bridge enhanced ACL, the bare procedure. And you can, uh, you can see that how this essentially they've moved on to the six months review and at the moment considering no difference on normal ACL recon reconstruction. But this is very early data. And this is highlighting how we need this bridge to wrap around the ACL to get it to try and heal. Now, what about the younger patient? Because this is quite an exciting area where there's perhaps more healing potential. And Adrian Wilson has reported two patients here, age five and age six, showing that so far at two years, no failure. This is uh, taking the younger patient, putting the sutures through, and then maybe getting this primary repair that we hope will then last, and only a small tunnel in the bone. Another group here in the, the knee journal in, uh, last, uh, in, in this year with five children, a mean follow-up now at 43 months, showing no injury to the growth area and all getting back to activity. So this is potentially quite exciting for the younger patient. So let's try and draw this all together. This is uh, trying to get a direct attachment of the uh, proximal tears, and we've seen the different techniques that have outlined. So far, we've got early good results, and what we need is that long-term result. How many are going to re-rupture or be converted to a full ACL reconstruction? Limited number of patients are suitable for this. It's the proximal tear. 
And the patients need to be aware, really, with that appropriate consent that they may get more problems, we might need to do more. The registry collects the real-world data. We have a pathway for primary repair, but as yet, no one's put their patients into it. It's in set groups. Really, if we've cracked primary repair, this is great, and we need to know with that long-term result. So what failure rate are we really going to accept? And then what technique are we going to be able to do? Yes, if we get the, the original ACL back, better proprioception, better kinematics of the knee, and easier to revise or convert to a full ACL but then the patient's having another uh, nine months out or however long it's going to be. What is the real failure of ACL in, in the general surgeon's hands? And what can we expect from an ACL and how do we compare it to that? These are aspects we need then to, to look at. But there are a lot of claims out there and, and you can read these on, on websites that uh, it's a revolutionary repair, we stitch it back to the origin, and normal ACL has a higher failure rate as 30%. Well, actually, what's being meant is that um, the adolescent girl has a failure rate of 15%, but they have a failure on the other side of 15%, or an injury rate. So it's not 30% in a normal ACL, it's 15% in one side. So these are some of the claims that may be out there on the internet that we need to be um, aware of. So the message is short-term results, good, and it's the long-term that we really need to find out what is going to be that conversion rate at five years, 10 years. And hopefully history is not repeating itself. Now, I met John Fagan many years ago when I was traveling on my fellowship, and um, so I've been listening to him for a long time, and I emailed him about this talk, and he said, primary repair alone is dead, but augmentation of the repair by a graft or a stent is an excellent solution to, to, to residual anatomic tissue, tissue to get it back in an anatomic way. And just as a throwaway, he does mention about the ALL, which is coming up uh, later in this bit. So um, he's been very interested in this following on from his original work and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And sticking with the bespoke theme, um, Simon, Simon Ball is going to now talk about choice of graphs and, and potentially different tunnel positions for, for different uh, people, different walks of life, I suspect, and different ages, maybe. Thank you, Jonathan. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Just to continue with the theme, when patients see us in clinic, I think they deserve and should demand our full attention. And so we need to individualise treatment pathways, as Nikki mentioned right at the start. And so once you've made a decision then to go ahead with surgery, there are decisions that need to be made. And put simply, your ACL reconstruction is a graft put in the right place. But the question is, what graft and where should you put it? So let's go through it. Well, let's look at the options on grafts. So keeping it simple, you've got autograft. You can see a few options. You've got allograft, and you've got synthetic. For the purpose of this presentation, I'm not actually going to talk about synthetic because I think that the Australian Knee Society has proven already that it doesn't work as a single bundle reconstruction. So let's look at hamstring. Hamstring is the graft of choice at the moment. If you look at the registries, over 90% of the primary ACLs that are put in will be hamstring. It's a good graft. Why do people use it? Because the technique of harvesting the hamstring is reproducible, it has low morbidity, and it does actually have a low failure rate if you look at the literature, particularly in lower level players, amateur, recreational sportsmen. So it's an excellent, excellent option for many patients you're going to see in clinic. But what about the patella tendon? Arguably, the best graft. Why? The patella tendon is an incredibly strong tendon because normally it takes excessive load when loading the joint. And not only is it a strong tendon, it has bone blocks at either end which can incorporate rapidly into bone tunnels that you drill. So it's an excellent graft and it has arguably, if you look at the literature, a lower re-rupture rate than hamstrings. Possibly lower, particularly in the elite, elite arena. But it comes at a price. And the problems are, you disrupt the extensor mechanism, you have a slower initial post-operative period, you certainly have an instance of anterior knee pain, and many patients will report that they're unable to kneel. And for some people, that's not acceptable. But it's definitely a useful graft. And it's certainly useful in revision cases, and possibly useful 
for elite sports people. Quadriceps tendon, relatively new graft. And the reason why it's sort of coming online is, is really due to the technological advances in how we harvest it. And so if we look at the, the diagram I've put up, you can see that we've got now a tendon harvester. And this enables you to take a partial thickness quad tendon graft through a relatively small incision. You can make a horizontal incision as shown, or you can do a small vertical incision. You can take it with a small bone block off the patella, so you still have that advantage of having a bone block attached. It's a very, very strong graft. And arguably, it may have a better functional outcome and a lower re-rupture rate. And certainly, there is a tre trend in the literature from Christian Fink's group, we've put lots of them in at the moment, to, to show that. But it's certainly not significant, but there is a trend. And there is an equivocal morbidity that's been shown in the literature so far to hamstrings. And so this may be the graft of the future. This may be the bone patella tendon bone without the anterior knee pain, perhaps. And what about allograft? Well, it doesn't have any morbidity. Fantastic. But it definitely has a high re-rupture rate. Now, the re-rupture rate is certainly coming down as the sterilization techniques get better, and the preparation for the graft improves. But it's certainly not a graft of choice for a young sports person. And it's definitely not the first graft to use when you've got an elite athlete, unless you have a very specific need. There are some specific athletes that may well need a, an allograft. It's unique. But it may well be very useful in an older, less active patient. And certainly the recent literature shows that the, the re-rupture rates in this group is equivocal whether you use autograft or, allogra or allograft. So it's certainly a good option. So once you've decided on your graft, you need to decide, well, where am I going to put it? I think most people in the orthopedic community and certainly in the knee world would agree that on the tibia, you're really aiming for the center of the footprint. So I'm not really going to talk about the tibial uh, tunnel. So I'm going to focus on the femoral tunnel position. So what I'm showing you on the screen here is a sagittal section through the distal femur. You see that that is the lateral wall of the intercondylar notch. And I'll just point out that the blue line there is the intercondylar ridge, and the red highlights where the ACL footprint on the femoral side is. So if you look at the arthroscopic image look, viewed from the anteromedial portal, you can see that you've got the intercondylar ridge, you've got the bifurcate ridge, which separates the anteromedial and patellar bundles. And then just to clarify some arthroscopic terminology, when people, people talk about being low or high on the lateral wall, what they actually mean is anterior, because when you're operating the knees at 90 degrees, so it's shown there, you're high, you're anterior. If you're low, you're posterior. And similarly, if you're deep, you're proximal, and if you're shallow, you're distal. So if we highlight the, uh, the footprint, and I've got the red is the anteromedial and green is the lateral. The question is, where should we put it? And I'm really going to focus on two positions. So you've got the anteromedial position. And you've got the center footprint position, which is termed anatomic, because it's in the middle. And so I just want to put up just one data set. This is a single surgeon series from one of my colleagues at Fortius. It's an elite uh, football group. So it's a unique subset of patients. But the advantage of this subset of patients is that they need their ACL reconstruction to work. And if it doesn't work, it will, if it's not right, it will fail. And when it fails, we know about it because they're in the public domain. So the data set is complete. So we've got over 200 cases, single surgeon series. And I've just represented there that you've got quadrupled hamstrings and bone tail tendon bone. And put in either an anteromedial bundle position or in a center footprint position. And if you look carefully, it's clear and significant that the anteromedial bundle re rupture rate is lower, whether you use hamstring or whether you use bone patella tendon bone, than the center footprint position. And you can also see that there is a trend for the bone patella tendon bone to have a slightly lower re rupture rate. So, where should we put it? The people who agree with the center footprint position and anatomic placement would argue that, well, the reason why it fails is because it's in the right position it gets loaded, it gives more stability to the graft, stability to the knee, and as a consequence, it fails more. But is that true? Well, let's step back and look at 
Let's do our due diligence and look at the anatomy. So re-look at the histology. And actually, what you find if you look at the histology of the ACL fibers, there are direct fibers that attach along the intercondylar ridge, and there are indirect fibers that reflect, and you see the posterior extension of the, indi of the indirect fibers. But it's not all about the anatomy. It's actually about the biomechanics. So if we look at the biomechanics and we look at the Imperial College study, uh, Imperial College study that did that looked at the what proportion or, or whereabouts are the most important fibres in the footprint. And what they found is that if you look at the squares G and H and what I've shown in the other picture with the red arrow, the fibres in that position give 85% resistance to anterior tibial translation, although variable effect on internal rotation. So certainly they seem to be the most important fibres. So coming to a conclusion, what do I do? Well, I think it's very important to customise your graft, and the only way you can do that is know your patient, listen, and listen hard. And then where do I put it? Well, I use an anteromedial uh, bundle position. The reason why? It's most isometric. It's the most important fibres. It's reproducible. It has a low re-rupture rate. And guess what? It's still anatomic. Thank you. Thank you. So further food for thought. Uh, we're going to move on to um, Adam Mitchell, who's going to give a radiological view. And, uh, and so speaking from a surgical perspective, uh, high quality imaging and, and radiology support is incredibly valuable. Um, so um, over to you, Adam. Thank you very much indeed. Um, my name is Adam Mitchell. I'm a radiologist and uh, I work at Fortius Clinic. Um, I'm going to be talking about missed lesions, and hopefully uh, we'll explain that as we go on um, through the start of the talk. Basically, ballpark stats, we're all very aware that the, the incidence of anterior cruciate ligament injury, 30 to 78 per 100,000. Um, 200,000 ACL reconstructions e uh, injuries per year in the States, of uh, which 100,000 uh, operations performed, so 50% are operated on. And um, solitary ACL injury occurs in about 50% of patients. So that means 50% have another injury, which we're all aware of. Why do they have it? Well, ACL injury, there's a complex mechanism to how it occurs. You can have external rotation, abduction, hyperflexion, anterior tibial displacement, so on and so forth. And you're all absolutely aware of all the mechanisms of these injuries. One thing that's key to it is that certainly if we look here and look at the age group, what the, uh, the time these injuries occur, it's around about 20 years old, uh, and it slowly peters out, slightly different for males and females. I use this slide really to illustrate the fact that getting it right is important because we've still got lots of years to go that we want to use this knee on. So why do we need to look for other lesions? Well, we're likely to get better long-term results. We can plan treatment. We can hopefully alter the outcome, and we're able to discuss this with the patient and discuss their needs and tailor what we're going to do to their needs. So what to look for and why? MCL injuries, fibular collateral ligament, postulateral coronary injuries, all relatively straightforward diagnosis, so I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, and I'm certainly not going to mention the Sigon fracture either, so what am I going to talk about? Well, I'm going to talk about some of the things that you can get from your radiologist. So. Meniscal tears, we're all very aware of what, what to look for, but it's important really to appreciate why we must look very carefully. We find a high percentage of these meniscal injuries are associated with cruciate ligament injury, commonest in the lateral meniscus acutely. In the paediatric population, it's up to 80%, so even more scrutiny is required uh, for these MRIs in the younger patients. We know that meniscal repair improves outcome, and in the disastrous situation where the ACL has got, been missed or the patient hasn't come to us, we do have a very high incidence of uh, medial meniscal injuries. So this was a patient that was referred to us, not done by us, but just came to us. And as you can see, there's a tiny little radial tear in the meniscus. This wasn't really appreciated. The problem is, is if we don't appreciate these injuries, it goes on to this sort of injury, which was about three weeks uh, after we saw the initial one. So we have to be aware that these injuries, albeit small, uh, can be potentially disastrous. 
the ramp lesion, much talked about and loved, something that uh, is really starting to come to the forefront of the radiological literature. Basically, it's a tear at the menisco caps of the junction of the back of the medial meniscus. We're all very aware of these lesions. There are some descriptions. It was first described by Strobel in 1988. And... Um, as we go on, we're becoming much more aware and being able to pick up these lesions. We find that it occurs in about 20% of ACL injuries, so that's quite a lot. What I'm told is it may well be an arthroscopic blind spot. So as radiologists, if we can pick this up and get this to uh, the, uh, the surgeons, all the better. Common, there are lots of subdivisions in the literature. Don't need to worry too much about those. What we did find out that early on in the literature that actually we were rubbish at picking these up. But now we're much more aware of these lesions. Um, it's probably better to have a chat with the radiologist uh, so they can have a good look around for these lesions. We don't have tons of data on there. Two new papers came out at the start of the year. One said you can uh, um, uh, demonstrate 50% on MRI scan. Another said you can demonstrate 50 to 80% on MRI scan. So it's still... Uh, um, food for thought, really. So, why is it important? Because um, if you fix this lesion, you actually get better biomechanical function of the knee. So, here's a patient, and you can see that the lateral meniscus and the lateral compartment is in pretty bad shape. The cruciate ligament's gone, and this demonstrates very nicely the edema at the back of the medial meniscus here. And this is a ramp lesion, pretty easy and straightforward when you know what to look for. So any edema at the back, raise that as a possibility. It also looks a bit furry on the axial images as well. This is another patient, slightly more subtle, but again, you can see there's more edema at the back than at the front in the fat there. Again, pretty straightforward. Again, we see the furriness around the back of the knee. Meniscofemoral ligament attachments as well. One of the problems is this so-called pseudo-lesion. It looks like there's a tear, but actually there isn't, as compared to the other uh, images that I've shown. And this is what it looks like here. So we don't want to overcall this as a posterior third lateral meniscal tear. There's also the little pseudo-lesion here of the fascicles as well. We don't want to overcall that. And this one here, demonstrating very nicely the popliteus tendon. No, what that is actually is the vertical tear in the posterior third of the lateral meniscus. And again, exactly the same. And if we miss that, we end up with this horrible situation where we've got a bucket handle tear. The fascicles at the back here, two sets, pretty straightforward to see, very important because they uh, maintain the stability at the back of the knee. And you can pretty much see them in all cases. In this case here, we can see that actually the superior fascicle has been torn. And this one here, of course, I'll just put that back in. That's the... Um, uh, the Risberg pseudo lesion that I showed you earlier. So again, easy to get caught out. We can see here that the inferior, the anterior inferior uh, fascicle is intact. The posterior superior completely torn in this pretty trashed posterior third of the lateral meniscus and obviously the ACL injury. So moving forwards, osteochondral fractures. Normal cartilage looks grey. It's very easy just to overlook that. Um, but we can see here that some of the cartilage is actually missing. Importantly, when you, fight, when you see this, you need to spend ages looking around the image. Here's where the cartilage is missing. Again, very straightforward. And there's the big lump of cartilage uh, situated in the front of the knee. And we'll be talking more about that in our quick fire radiology session tomorrow. Meniscal root injuries. Again, there are bucket loads of classifications for these root injuries. The whole point about the meniscal root injury is that, that the meniscus has all these internal fibres. It's very complex. It has these circumferential fibres here, which are important in providing the, hoops, the hoop uh, um, stress in order that the weight and the forces can be dissipated throughout the knee. You can have all that, but if you haven't got it attached by the root, then it's not worth having the meniscus. Leprade classified these into uh, uh, an almost unmemorable set of classifications. Um, but uh, importantly, what you should look for is the triangle at the back, the meniscus, and this should make land and make contact on bone. And you can see it's here, and it doesn't. There's nothing. So that's a root tear. And on the coronal images, you can see, again, it fails to land at the back there. So look out for those. 
The arcuate fractures, these are small hairline fractures. We're always taught the smaller the fracture, the bigger the injury. You can get tiny fractures of the fibular head, and these can, can take off the ligaments here, any combination that you like. And what to look for on the MRI is this tiny little fracture here, and you can see actually it's taken off the popliteal fibular ligament in this case. Tibial spine fractures, again, in the younger patient. The unfortunate thing about these is you will see that the uh, um, anterior intermeniscal ligament can get caught beneath it. These are a couple of examples here showing this. So again, very important to look out. So in summary, there's a high chance of finding an associate, uh, associated injury. You need to look out for the usual suspects, the posterior lateral corner, fibular collateral ligament, medial collateral ligament, but there are a number of other game changes. So it's not just those classic three, there are other usual suspects. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Adam. That uh, shows the importance of expert review. And now, it's my great pleasure to introduce Andy Williams, who's made a very significant contribution to the management of the antro uh, lateral complex, and in fact, a world authority on that. I, I should say that when I was at Stanmore as a senior lecturer, Andrew was my senior SHO. Uh, despite that, he's carried on to make an unqualified success of this. Thank you very much indeed. What an introduction. ACL reconstruction is not as good as we once thought, not as good as we'd hoped. There are numerous papers involving testing of biomechanics which confirm that the uh, motion of the joint is abnormal, and there are just a number of them listed here. We got interested in seeing if we could improve things. Andrew Amos mentioned the power of a lateral procedure in controlling rotation, so we looked at the anatomy and we published uh, on this three months after a seminal paper by Stephen Klaas and his group from Leuven in uh, Belgium. And the uh, anatomy that's been described is shown on this specimen, which is one of our dissections. This knee is at 90 degrees, the femur is up here, tibia here, the lateral edge of the patella is the white pin, Gerdes tubercle and the tibia, the green pin, and the red pin is at the femoral insertion of the lateral collateral ligament. And you can see coursing over it superficially a structure that's orientated obliquely and would actually function well to resist internal rotation. So we got very excited about this structure, so-called anterolateral ligament, and decided to do some more work on it. But in fact, with time, it became obvious that the IT band with its attachments to the femur that you can see here tensing, as Christoph Kittel, who wrote up a lot of the work, uh, shows us, there's this big, thick band from Gurdy's tubercle that goes up and it inserts to the femur. Now, if you notice, the IT band has been dissected off anteriorly and flapped posteriorly. And so this is really the deep capsuosseous layer, the so-called uh, and the posterior part of the IT band that it inserts into the femur. So a very major structure. We've investigated this in detail and just summarized Christoph's work, which has been published Contrary to all the furore and excitement about the anterolateral ligament, it's really the um, ITB and its attachments to the femur that are the primary restraint to internal rotation, which is a critical part of the pivot shift, in angles 30, 60, and 90 degrees. In fact, the ACL was only of secondary importance apart from close to extension. And so therefore, we think that an IT band-based uh, operation would work best. The, Attachment points of Gerdy's tubercle to the Kaplan fibers that you saw attaching to the femur are the most isometric structure laterally. And if you take a strip of iliteal band leaving it attached to Gerdy's tubercle <clears throat> and you attach it to the femur, so long as you take that graft deep to the lateral collateral ligament, then it performs well in biomechanical testing. This is a beautiful dissection from Pittsburgh for, by Elmer Herbst, who works with Freddie Fu. And it may, um, may not surprise you that people would criticize a tenodesis where a graft's taken deep to the LCL as being very non-anatomic. But if you look at this, you can see how the band of tissue from Gerdy's tubercle moves up in a linear fashion, then curves to its attachment. And so by using the LCL as a pulley, you perhaps reproduce a more normal structure, I would suggest. Christoph Kittel was replaced at Imperial College by Ivan Interhaug, who's from Norway, and he's done a lot of work and, if you like, due diligence on the various techniques. And again, I'll summarize them for speed. He's found that if you create an extra 
anterolateral lesion by dividing Kaplan's fibres by slicing the anterolateral capsule and at the ALL, then if you simply do an ACL reconstruction alone, if you've cut, that, cut out the ACL, it won't restore normality. You need to do something lateral. He's found that tenodices need to be taken deep to the LCL, as I mentioned, and he's found that anterolateral, uh, sorry, anterolateral ligament reconstructions are much less effective than tenodices. And from the surgical technique point of view, it's essential that the anterolateral ligament is tightened with the knee completely straight, whereas for a tenodesis, you don't need to worry about the angle of fixation. It's very important to concentrate on this slide if you're a surgeon because it is possible to over-tighten things. The shoulder surgeons taught us with their crude uh, reconstructive surgery in the old days for things like putty plat, where I was taught certainly never to let the arm come out past a uh, neutral position. Terrible for function and it caused a fixed contracture that led to osteoarthritis. If you fix the tibia in external rotation, it'll stabilize the knee, but at the price of osteoarthritis. And so you should think of this really as a check rein structure, a bit like an MPFL reconstruction, not something that's tensioned like hell. And you should have no more than 20 newtons tension on it, and the tibia should be in neutral. And in that, with that scenario in the lab, there was no over-constraint. But of course, all lab studies are limited by the fact they're time zero, by which I mean, at that moment we tested them, they're okay, but then they may stretch, they then heal, they may scar up. And so we don't really know what's going on. There are no substitute for clinical outcome studies long term. But there's some reassurance from the group in Lyon with Henri de Jour's patients of over 20 years follow-up, they didn't have a significantly increased risk of osteoarthritis. Brian Devitt's done a literature search and published that recently. He too suggests that the risk of osteoarthritis regarding this technique is limited. Now, the indications are difficult to be certain of because there's no test we can do that says that there's excess laxity in the anterolateral complex. And so it's a judgmental situation. So all I can tell you is what I do, and I do a tenodesis in all revision cases and primary cases such as these that I think are at risk of re-rupture, particularly in the children. So early results, these are to be taken with a pinch of salt because they're only at 12 months, but we compared two groups of similar numbers with an isolated ACL reconstruction against those with an ACL reconstruction and a Le Maire procedure. We showed no loss of range of motion and a significantly reduced abnormal pivot shear from 9% to 2%. So this is the technique, skin incision towards but not into my finger, which is overlying Gertie's tubercle, about four or five centimeters long. Deepen that incision down to the IT band that you can see the white structure here. Place a retractor at Gertie and then make an incision on the posterior edge of Gertie's tubercle and then one anterior, and that's about a centimetre, a centimetre and a half long. And then that strip needs to be uh, carried proximally. And the way to decide how long to make it is to place your finger within the gap in the IT band, palpate the lateral collateral ligaments, and have at least another two centimetres proximal before amputating the graft. That graft has to go deep to the LCL, so we have to expose that, so I palpate it clear the soft tissue overlying it with a knife, and then incise along the anterior border of the LCL, as you can see, just here, and then going through that, place some scissors to create a tunnel just deep to the LCL. It's important not to go into the joint and violate the joint space as more morbidity occurs. And then with that, I create an attachment point 10 millimetres proximal to the uh, LCL attachment of the femur and 5 millimetres posteriorly. This knee is at 9 at uh, sorry, 70 degrees, as you can see, and then place a suture anchor. The problem with drilling a tunnel, which is an attractive idea, is the drill often will hit the ACL graft, which is obviously not a good thing. Take the graft deep to the um, LCL, and then you can see on the next video the effect of rotation. So this controls the rotation. You see how the graft moves fore and aft as I rotate the um, knee. With the foot neutral, and usually I tension it with the knee at about si uh, 60 degrees, I then suture the graft down to the femur, and then the bit that's remaining is folded over the LCL and sutured back to itself. And you can see here, there's still ability to move the knee. It's essential, it's not over-tightened. And finally, I close the IT band over the top. 
Recently, I've been leaving the IT band distal, close to the Gurdjieff tubercle, open, uh, partly because it gets quite tight, and also because it causes extra thickening of the soft tissue layers and a lump occurs. In testing the lab, we found that there's no excess tension on the patella, causing abnormal kinematics there. And the wound usually is around four or five centimetres long, but uh, it can be made smaller by moving the wound up and down. I should acknowledge all of those who have done the hard work at Imperial College under the guidance of Andremus, and these are my disclosures. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Uh, now, moving on, Giles Halpin is going to uh, talk about managing meniscal lesions. And it's already been raised about the importance of um, meniscal pathology in terms of outcome. Good morning, everyone. So, my task is to talk about the management of meniscal lesions. This slide, I think, nicely shows the complex interrelationship between the ligaments, the menisci, and the chondral surfaces in the knee joint. And it's a slide we'll come back to at several stages during the talk. Over the last 20 or 30 years, I think everybody understands that preserving meniscal tissue is increasingly recognized to be important. Uh, and as a result, our meniscal repair techniques have transformed, really, over the years. And we can now repair a huge variety of meniscal tear configurations. And that's something that all knee surgeons, I think, need to be able to do. And the purpose of this talk really is just to try and illustrate a few scenarios where we know that preserving meniscal tissue makes a big difference to long-term outcome. This is something that we touched on earlier. Knee surgeons for years have noticed that recovery time following a lateral meniscectomy is very different to that following a medial meniscectomy. And we also know that the, co the most common reason for early retirement from, from elite soccer is a lateral meniscal meniscectomy, a lateral meniscectomy, I should say. Why is that? We've seen these slides of Andy's before. A fairly innocuous looking lateral meniscal tear with a conservative resection, and before too long you end up with bone on bone in the lateral compartment. Why is this? A lot relates to anatomy. So in the medial compartment, there's natural conformity between the medial femoral condyle and the medial tibial plateau. Whereas on the lateral side, if you look at the slide over here, once the meniscal tissue is removed, you have point loading, and the chondral surfaces suffer very quickly as a result. The evidence has been convincing in the literature for many years. There are multiple papers showing that lateral meniscectomy does badly. This single surgeon series in the American Journal of Sports Medicine from 2014 looked at exclusively elite soccer players with a nearly 50-50 split between lateral meniscectomies and medial meniscectomies. And the results are interesting. At first glance, return to play doesn't seem very different with an average of seven weeks in the lateral meniscal group and five weeks in the medial meniscal group. But once you look at adverse events, you see nearly 70% of people who have a lateral meniscectomy end up with problems with swelling and synovitis. And repeat surgery didn't happen once in the medial meniscectomized group, but 7% in the lateral meniscectomized group. And at all time points in the study, the chance of getting back to play was six times greater if you had medial meniscal surgery compared to lateral meniscal surgery. And I think that is pretty convincing that preserving lateral meniscal tissue is important. Now we come to the ramp lesion, which Adam uh, talked a little bit about before. And this really focuses on the complex relationship between ligaments and menisci in the context of stability, not chondral protection. The ramp lesion is this posterior meniscocapsular separation at the back of the medial meniscus, described by Strobel and then Steve Bollen with this incidence, which we think is around about 20%. How to repair it's controversial. These images here show Bertrand Sonnery Cotet's preferred repair technique, which uses a suture shuttle and a posteromedial portal, which for most knee surgeons aren't core skills. We'll come back to that later. And our experience clinically was that some knees just seemed very, very unstable. So this knee on the left has a huge Lachman's test. It has a gross pivot shift. And often in, when we looked inside, we'd find not only an ACL rupture, but also a ramp lesion. And we then noticed that once the ramp lesion was repaired, the knee felt more stable before the ACL was addressed. And the video on the right shows, should show uh, a much reduced Lachman's test and a much reduced pivot shift. So Joe Stephen and the group at Imperial set out to prove this. It was published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine in 2016. And essentially, this was a se sequential cutting study followed by biomechanical testing. And the kinematics, kinematics of various different scenarios were investigated. So the normal knee, 
the ACL deficient knee, the ACL deficient knee with a ramp lesion, then the ramp was repaired, the ACL was reconstructed, and then at the end, the ramp lesion repair was divided, and finally, the ACL graft was divided. This shows creation of a ramp lesion using a beaver knife from the posteromedial portal. So you can see the blade just coming between the back of the medial meniscus and the posterior capsule, causing that meniscocapsular separation. And then these videos show an all-inside meniscal suture device being used to repair the ramp lesion. And if you watch the video on the right, you can see that knot snugs down very nicely and gets good compression across the ramp lesion. And this is important because we think now that actually you don't have to use a suture shuttle on a posteromedial portal and you can use an all-inside repair technique. And what did the results show? Well, what they showed very simply was that repairing the, repairing the ramp lesion and reconstructing the ACL very much approximates the kinematics of the intact knee. If we look at the final bars on the graft here, if the ramp lesion is neglected, looking at the x-axis here, there's an extra three millimetres or so of anterior translation if that ramp lesion is neglected. And we think that almost certainly leads to increased forces being transmitted across the ACL graft in the early recovery phase. So this paper concluded that a ramp lesion significantly increases knee instability, that ACL reconstruction alone does not restore that stability, that repairing both the ramp lesion and reconstructing the ACL best reproduces normal knee kinematics. And, we, and this study felt that an all-inside technique was reasonable in this scenario. But that required a bit more work. And so just recently, this has been submitted for publication but hasn't been published yet, we looked at all-inside meniscal repair devices. We looked at 20 fresh frozen cadaveric knees. We compared ultra fast fix and fast fix 360 mainly because they were the devices used in that American Journal of Sports Medicine publication. Four devices per knee. The knee was then cycled and then sectioned above the menisci. And these images show the ramp lesion repair. They show how scarily close you are to the, to the neurovascular bundle with the sharp meniscal suture device. This shows the ramp lesion repair from the undersurface of the meniscus. And then once the knee was sectioned, we very carefully dissected out each of the individual peak anchors. There are two per device, and we wanted to see eight of these in an extracapsular position. Failure is defined as any of these in an intra-articular position. And these are our results. With ultra-fast fix, only 2.5% of those anchors were in an intra-articular position. And we felt on the back of that that it was reasonable to recommend the use of uh, an all-inside ultra-fast fix design, device for ramp lesion repair, which makes it hugely easier than using a suture shuttle. It's very important when you do this that your technique's meticulous, and sometimes these devices will fail, and it's really important that you take out any failed uh, devices so that you don't cause any intra-articular damage. So that's the ramp lesion in terms of stability. We've talked about the lateral meniscus in terms of chondral surfaces. So what about the lateral meniscal root? And this is an area that we're becoming more interested in, in, in the context of its contribution to stability. This paper has just recently come out from Robert Leprade's group, and this was similar to Andy Williams's ramp lesion study in that it was a study design that was cadaveric and was a sequential, a sequential cutting study. And in essence, the knees were divided into two groups, the ACL was cut, then the lateral meniscal root, then the meniscofemoral ligaments in one group. And in the second group, the lateral meniscal root, the ACL, and then the, the meniscofemoral ligaments. And their results are interesting. So with the simulated pivot shift, the lateral meniscal root is an important stabilizer of the knee for anterior tibial translation at lower flexion angles and for internal rotation at higher flexion angles. So where does all of this leave us? I think it's becoming increasingly obvious that preserving meniscal tissue as much as possible is the right thing to do. We need to pres preserve it for chondral protection, particularly in the lateral compartment. We must try and repair ramp lesions for stability. We probably should be repairing lateral meniscal root lesions for stability. And in essence, I think the take home message is save the meniscus at all costs and only resect the meniscus when all else fails. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giles. And um, completing our session uh, this morning uh, and focusing on some of the things that Adam brought up in terms of missed injuries um, is Martin. Martin Goddard is going to be looking at associated ligament injuries with ACL rupture.
Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to talk about the associated ligament injury seen with ACL injury. So you might wonder why in an ACL session that we're talking about the other ligaments. Well, they often go unrecognized and they're common. And if they are unrecognized, they can lead to extra laxity in the knee, increase the already significant proprioceptive deficits that can lead to poor performance and then with continued loading of the joints, the development of a Charcot-type joint or arthritis. So one of the things we can do is discourage our amateur sportsmen from returning to sport to try and reduce that risk of arthritis. So the other important reason is that these unaddressed factors may cause the primary ACR reconstruction to fail. And ligament laxity and malalignment will cause increased stresses across the graft and then cause that graft to fail. So what are we aiming to do? So we're abolishing laxity and we're maximizing proprioception. When surgery is needed, repair or allowing healing of the ligament is better than reconstruction alone. So if possible, operate in the first two to three weeks. But not everybody needs early surgery. So these were two high-profile cases with similar injuries. Both had grade 3 ACL, grade 2 PCL, and grade 3 MCLs. They were managed similarly with bracing for six weeks and then an isolated ACL reconstruction, which is a much smaller procedure than operating on both ligaments early. So therefore, minor PCL injuries, especially with an MCL of any grade, do very well with bracing. And the more modern PCL braces have revolutionized the treatment of these injuries, allowing the knee to be held in a reduced position so that the ligament can then heal. This is another case. This is a UK 17-year-old gymnast who in 2007 was the World Athletics Champion Gold in the 100 meters. Shortly after that, she whilst landing on a trampoline, sustained this significant injury. She had a grade three ACL, a grade two PCL, a grade three MCL, a postural corner avulsion, and an osteochondral fracture. She was managed with acute fixation of the osteochondral fracture, repair of the menisci, repair of the postural corner, and then braced for six weeks. She then went on to have an isolated ACL reconstruction eight weeks later. So how did she get on? Well, she was Andy's patient, and in 2012, when she returned, she won a bronze in the 4x100 metres. In 2014, she broke the 4x100 metres record twice. And then in Rio in 2016, she got a bronze. And then in the World Athletics Championship in 2017, she got a silver. So she did very well. So moving on to the ACL-MCL injury, which is the classic skier's injury. These recreational skiers can be treated with bracing first and then a delayed ACL reconstruction. But it's different in athletes. And operating early on both the ACL and the MCL reduces the risk of MCL laxity but counterbalanced with the operative risk of causing stiffness in the knee. Not using a brace also reduces muscle wasting, and players simply won't wait, so operating early reduces their eventual return to sport. So what is the standard MCL treatment? It's bracing for six weeks, non-weight bearing initially with the brace 30 to 60 degrees, partial weight bearing for the second two weeks, the brace 10 to 90 degrees, and then for the final two weeks, full weight bearing and free range in the brace. But some MCLs are going to require surgery, and these are the severe MCLs. So avulsions of the MCL, where the surface area is very small for healing, will need operative treatment. Also in this example, where the MCL is in an intra-articular position, or there's the stenolite lesion, where the MCL is pulled proximally and then lies anterior to the pes tendons and is irreducible without surgery. 
So the MCL is the hardest of the knee ligaments to get right with surgery. And the operative technique is repairing the three layers and then protecting with a reconstruction. So if repair of a ligament or fixation of an avulsion is possible, early surgery is best. However, after two to three weeks, there'll be too much scarring. If there is an option for bracing, then surgery can be safely delayed, and this has the advantage of allowing a smaller operation once the bracing protocol has been finished. However, by that time, there is no chance for ligament repair and the proprioceptive advantage that that can give. So we've heard a lot about graft choices already, and I will support the autograft choice for ACL, PCL, postural lateral corner. Allograft really only for power athletes, including sprinters and rowers, and then synthetic augmentation for the MCL. So who needs early surgery in the context of a multi-ligament injury? In the knee dislocation setting with vascular injury or instability that's not controlled, external fixation or early repair or reconstruction is indicated. There's no rush on the ACL. High-grade PCLs need early surgery. The MCL less often so now, with the main risk of early surgery to the MCL being stiffness afterwards. The postural lateral corner does do better with early surgery, and the surgical technique depends on the anatomic location of the injury. So fibular head fractures need reducing and fixing. Where the attachment has peeled off the fibular head, that can be held reduced with a transosseous suture. And mid-substance mid ruptures are treated with repair and reconstruction. It's important not to underestimate the proprioceptive deficit with multi-ligament injuries. And we've heard as well that the rehabilitation time is in excess of two to three years. The PCL rehab protocol dominates the rehabilitation. So this is a series of 40 years data led by Andy Williams, looking at the outcome of 94 elite athletes who all had a minimum of two ligaments reconstructed with the outcome measure being returned to pre-injury level or not, which really is all that matters to this group of patients. And in a group of professional athletes, it's an easy way to follow people up. So the patients were young. There were 12 by cruciate injuries, 81 uni cruciate injuries. So what does the data tell us about how these patients do? Well, if you have an ACL and an MCL, you're going to do well and it's not going to take that long to get back. If you have an ACL and a postural lateral corner, you're still going to do quite well, but it's going to take a bit longer to get there. By the time we start getting to the bicruciate injuries with an extra ligament, the numbers are much rarer, they're smaller numbers. So evaluating return to sport is harder, but you can see from the table that it takes much, much longer to get back. It's not all plain sailing, with complications and additional surgery in two-fifths. With stiffness, surgery for removal of metalwork, and further meniscal surgery being the main ones. So what have been the game changers with managing ACLs and multiple ligaments? Well, realising not all these cases need an early operation. Synthetic MCL grafts. PCL braces to downgrade injuries. But these cases are time demanding and challenging, but good results are possible. Thank you. First of all, I'd just like to actually congratulate all of the speakers on timekeeping. Uh, it is one of my bugbears, and uh, so not having to be mad dog for that session was great. Um, the other thing I, I think the speakers will notice is the difference between being a clinician and a professional sportsman. They don't get comfy white armchairs to sit in. They all have to stand in a line. So uh, obviously realise where they went wrong. Uh, I'll give them the microphone over. Uh, so we've got about, about 20 minutes, um, or just under 20 minutes. And so, so any questions? from the audience would be gratefully received. Um, I just want to sort of kick off with Nikki. Um, 
uh, considering what she's surrounded by. I think uh, I sympathise already. Um, the, uh, one of the questions, I think one of the problems with viewing conservative against surgical management is the enormous variation in what conservative actually means. The quality of rehab, the availability of rehab is, is massive difference between different groups. And could you just sort of perhaps give us a bit of a feeling of how you can unpick that when you try and look at studies about, about whether conservative or surgical management is appropriate? That's a good question, because it's often very hazy how that rehab is described. Because it's usually a big paper talking in detail about either the surgery or not surgery, and then, oh, they had standard rehab. And it doesn't actually say anything more than that. And as you just said, there's rehab and rehab. Um, and I think that's really difficult to, certainly in the published literature, but certainly what I pick up in clinic that I see as well, where we might get somebody that might be a failed rehab, but when you actually look at what they've done, um, it may not be, it may not have been anywhere near enough. You heard those footballers, and you said you saw what they had to put themselves through, and how hard they have to work. And I think that's what many people don't appreciate: is that actually to get this, to get themselves back to sport, that's one heck of a training program they've got to go through, and they need to get their head around that. There's a current trend for honesty, which is a good thing, of course, and we're a lot of soul searching about our terrible results may say research. Only a third of people get back. Well, it's all about interpretation because if you have to do what you have to do to get back, I don't know how I do a rehab program. And these are intelligent people we're operating on, and they make a choice. They get, we give them a nice stable knee, and then they stop doing the dangerous thing. So is that a bad result, I ask you? I think it's a fantastic result. So return to play as a measure of success is bullshit at best. Your, I thought your talk was absolutely amazing. It was fantastic. Covered everything beautifully. And one of the things we can't do, we can't even measure outcome. We cannot measure outcome. I'll say it again. We cannot measure outcome. It's shocking. There's no prosthesis that's ever had proper outcome measured. There's no procedure we do in medicine. And so we have to make a value judgment. And I thought that came across brilliantly in the talk. And people just don't talk about it. We assume that outcome scores are really valid. No, they're not. We are in a real mess. And so the question of quality of outcome is a very difficult one. Hey. Just one uh, some of you might be thinking of your own questions. Um, uh, a question to Tim Spalding. It's a little bit about uh, on top of um, Andy's point about outcome. Now, um, obviously, repairing the ACL that's partially damaged is a very appealing uh, prospect. A couple of things. Does it, for the, from the patient's point of view, does it offer an improvement in terms of their speed of rehabilitation? And secondly, can, uh, several of us have spoken about the improvement in proprioception. Can we actually show that, although it's a theoretical thing? So two points, really, Tim. Yeah, I tried to um, look at those papers and try and see how they've quantified return to sport. And that is a proposed argument that patients are going to get back quicker. There are the anecdotal stories of very fast return, but it's what the average patient will do, and that is the key. So I think, yes, that is a big advantage that early return to sport for ACL repair is there. Defining outcome is what we consider as a good outcome. We can measure lots of things and whether that matters then, and that's the point, really. If it works, will it work long enough? Or if we accept a failure rate, what failure rate do we accept? But if a patient can get back quicker at four months instead of nine months, and a 20% failure rate, then there's a trade-off. If we explained it right, that's what we've got to understand. Tim, while you've got the microphone, um, while everybody's holding back on all their questions, uh, but, and we'll, we've got some people putting their hands up, but just following through on the, the repair, one of the issues is time scales. I think the general consensus is that the earlier you get to repair something, the better. And one of the problems is the late presentations. A lot of people go through a long period of time of being re reassured and undertreated and then end up sort of coming along. And is there a cutoff point when you think when repair is probably too late? I'm speaking from talking to others in the papers, it's, it's a six week period. So I've not bought in yet to the primary repair. I'm a watch and wait and see others what they're, what they're doing. 
So I'm nervous about this failure rate. Um, and often with an ACL, we'll wait six weeks anyway before reconstruction, and a proportion of people seem to be doing okay. The, the, maybe there is that end of a spectrum of the elite athlete. That's a different picture. And that's why it's fascinating to see the results, how it's going. But the, the uh, talks I hear and, and the papers is all about in the first six weeks, that very proximal tear in about 10, 15% of your population. So it is this early time period. Having, having not done one since yesterday, I, I can only comment on my recent experience, I must say. But if yeah. this has worked, if it works and they've cracked primary repair by proper fixation, then this is brilliant. Yeah, well, I'm, so, 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 I'm a huge fan. Just, I think it, you know, when, you, when you feel like you're putting something back together again and it looks, you know, this, you know, for me it's early, relatively early experience, but it looks and feels right. It, it's got to be the right thing, but I just feel you, you, know, you want to get to people early. So, we've so got then you need good questions. quality MRI. Rapid access to surgery, you've got to get in and do it. Yep, so. Hi there, um, Asa Safadin from Stanmore, consultant radiologist. There's um, literature now about the triple bundle ACL, uh, which we can identify sometimes on MR. Is it of any relevance clinically? The, how long have you got? The, <laughs> that may, maybe Simon, uh, since, you, since you want to put, how many bundles can you get in? I mean, it sort of follows on from Tim's point and Andy's point that it's all about outcomes, isn't it? So we can talk about three bundles, four bundles, five bundles, but it's actually can you do the operation, can it be reproducible, and do you get good outcomes? And the data for the double bundle reconstruction is pretty conclusive in that you know, it's, it doesn't actually show much benefit. So, yeah, there may be three bundles, but as I talked about with the histology and the biomechanics, we can look at the histology, but it's actually the biomechanics that are very important. And it's the outcome data that's important, and that's the problem, as Andy's highlighted. If we haven't got the outcome data, then we don't know how to compare. But I would have a guess that if we try to put three bundles in, it won't work as well as a single bundle. Right. Thank you. Um, Fiona Watt from the Kennedy Institute in uh, Oxford. Um, I really enjoyed all of those talks, and I continue to learn from, from you all. Um, I, I wanted to come back to the, the Frabel paper, which I know is very controversial, but one of the interesting things it highlights is the rates of patellofemoral OA and perhaps some differences in risks of different graphs there. And I just wondered if, if one or, or several of the speakers could comment on, on patella grafting versus hamstring and that particular risk in this patient group. Yeah, the, um, the, obviously the paper is well known and uh, the fact that I can be teaching Fiona something is astonishing, one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. Um, it's relevant to, I think, to the work we've been doing with the inflammatory response to trauma and the various biomarkers that Fiona and her colleagues have been um, measuring. There are, orthopedic surgeons are obsessed with mechanics as a cause of osteoarthritis, and so if you're malaligned, you can think of overloading something just the wheels in your car and the line they wear at the tires. If you have instability, that shearing of the joint surface is bad. So if you have an ACL rupture, it is an internal rotation, subluxation of a tibia, hence the bone bruising in the lateral compartment. But they don't often get lateral osteoarthritis, and yet during the rehab period, particularly in sportsmen who rehab like hell, they end up with patellofemoral lesions. The patellofemoral joint takes the highest loads of the body, and so something bad must happen to the articular cartilage in response to trauma. And I, my experience has been it's usually when patients swell. And so the swellers have to be taken very seriously, have to slow down, because they don't in professional sport, and they develop a hole in the articular cartilage. So I think that there's a very, very important uh, message to not load through swelling. The next issue is about grafts. And I think that's a, there's a historic um, problem. And so if we use literatures out of date, it's only relevant to that period of time. And so patella tendon ACL reconstruction, which was probably the first operation that sort of worked, um, done 20, 20, 25, 30 years ago. Unfortunately, the rehab was appalling. You'd be stuck in a plaster for six weeks. The patella pulled down with contracture from the fat pad. And we didn't understand the importance of getting these straight. And so we absolutely wrecked the mechanics of patella femoral joint from that. But I, I'm not sure with modern techniques for patella tendon re reconstruction is any worse. But the trouble is the data is always historic and it lags behind. So I think it's really hard to interpret it. Just a question, Simon, following on about graphs. Is, 
do we think we're being trained out of patella tendon harvest? And one of the worries I've been, at least 90% of, of graphs of uh, hamstrings currently, you're suddenly faced with an elite sportsman and the idea perhaps is a patella tendon graft is a better graft. Do you think enough people are being trained up to, to actually be able to cope with that? No. <laughs> um, I've only got to look at my own training, having come through relatively recently, look at the training of other fellows and senior registrars coming through the training scheme. Most people do hamstring ACL reconstruction. That's what they're exposed to during their training. That's what they end up doing. And, you know, I've got an exceptionally good mentor in Andy Williams. And when you're managing an elite athlete, you should do what you do best. And so there is an argument to say that the patella tendon may be the better graph, but if it's not the best graph in your hands, it may not be the right thing to do, actually. Um, but I think that individualizing your surgery is important, and therefore, if you're going to be a serious ACL surgeon, you have to be appropriately trained on all the graft harvests. And so I do think it's important that we do get appropriate training. Um, but it's difficult because a lot of people don't require a bone patella tendon bone reconstruction, and it does come at a price. So the question is, how do you get that training? Um, that was the difficult. question. I think most people probably don't do enough. Yeah. Okay. Perhaps, so we've got one, maybe one final question before, before lunch. Then. Thank you to all the um, speakers. Um, a common kind of question that happens in trauma meetings is a, is a neck of femur fracture in a young patient. And despite the risk of AVN, we usually, well, what I've seen is most of the time, dynamic hip screws used. Going along that thought process, with the ACL uh, augmented repair, if the patient is young, is it not worth the risk of potential failure with the benefit of, of having the native kind of um, ACL ligament? That's for you to well. I think, I think, they, I that, think that's, that. yes, that's what we have to decide on. That is the, the balance and the trade-off, the benefit of your own proprioception. And we need to know it lasts, and whether that technique because if you just do a, if you leave a patient no ACL reconstruction, they seem stable at six weeks, then a proportion of those will fail if they go back to high level sports. So that primary repair of an unoperated on ACL has a failure rate. And that's what we've got to understand. Can I make a point on the data bit? I think it, the huge amount of data that's coming out and that you've put together your, your results and the understanding that thing is very important. And then we know our outcomes. And I know uh, you realize and with the ligament registry and understanding what work we do and understanding then if patella tendon is actually better or less problems from it and then we can combat these um, statements that you see read because of that publication bias of someone being able to get a, a high profile paper <coughs> or a point in a high profile paper for their publication bias so I think keeping data is important then we can understand the real benefit of these techniques <coughs> I think we've got one final question then Andrew Edwards, orthopaedic surgeon up in Yorkshire. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm continuing the line on uh, ACL repair. Concern is that the mechanism of an ACL injury surely isn't just its avulsion of the femoral wall. There must be intrasubstance microscopic tears of the uh, fibros and fibres, and those must heal not normally, with normal uh, um, uh, elasticity. Therefore, is there a way of picking those that would do well with primary repair? It may look good, but the intrasubstance part of the ACL is rubbish. So the, th the throwback is that the reconstructed ACL is rubbish. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> it is. So, I mean, how many in the audience have bought into the concept of trying to repair back the proximal avulsion. It is an appealing concept. It's then um, we want good techniques and we want that understanding that it will last. And the worry is the history, as I've said, but I'm not trying to. Well, did I answer your question? I, I think the imaging is really important as well. So I think you, know, you need to see that clear proximal avulsion with an ACL that on an MRI scan looks undamaged beneath it. I accept that you can't see microscopic damage, but I think you need a, a really good quality MRI scan before selecting your patients. Well, the key is follow-up, isn't it? And I think you may have a very good point, and you may find that if we get the tissue to heal, it doesn't work. Well, then we're certainly some of the tubular avulsion fractures that I've fixed 
look fantastic, but then you examine them there, they end up loose, and it must be intra-substance damage that's irreparable, I guess. The, the clock tells me we've got one more minute, so... Hi, Mark Bowditch. Um, I'm a knee surgeon in East Anglia. Just a, um, a question to the panel in general. Um, I, I do over 100 ACLs a year. I've done those for 17 years or so as a consultant. For the first sort of um, 10, 12 years, um, my revision rate was around about 3 4%. I then um, decided to listen and try to change to the central anatomic uh, position. After a while, I thought it was excellent. I was doing it well. I was scoring the same sort of sites as all those uh, international knee surgeons. Um, however, my secretary turned around and said to me, Mark, the revision rate's gone up. You're doing a lot of these. What have you done? However, I looked at that, and suddenly I was around about the 10 or 12%. And I haven't published it. Um, but I was really quite worried, and I've gone back to the old position, perhaps the anteromedial site, and the revision rates got the revisions have gone down again. Is that central anatomic site now dead? Yes. Uh, well, it is now. <laughs> well, that was exactly my experience, and it, it was quite scary, really. But I, what I wonder, and what I've worried about, is. Should we ever introduce a change of technique like that again um, in the knee world? How can we stop it happening? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we have a, actually a duty to follow our patients up, and it's part of, I think it's part of the GMC um, good practice guide, isn't it? And it's a bit we all forget about, but uh, we have a, a lifelong duty to follow our patients, and if we see anything adverse, to report it. And as you say, we make big changes without really um, thinking of consequences. It, you know, it seems logical. We had a couple of the world's absolute experts, people I've looked up to for most of my professional life, and it seems obvious, doesn't it? Put it in the middle of the footprint. And I think they were wrong, unfortunately. I, I think we should probably call it a day. Sorry. Just one of the, then the duty of care is if we realize something is not working, what we then do about it. And yes, I put videos out there how to get to the mid-bundle position. So now I really need to take those down and say, actually, the science now has argued that going back up towards AM is, is better. I never said it was better. I just said how to get there. So it's very interesting that turn that round. So when you realize something's not working, um, like Fagan did for his repair. So that's why do we jump into primary repair? Do we go to the mid-bundle position? Um, it's, it's very interesting and in how you then say when something is not working and you move on, and that's what these meetings are about. Truth because I wasn't thinking of you, but I do apologize. But the good thing is you looked at it scientifically, you followed it, you tested it, and so you've got a clear conscience. And I think Mark's point is well made. We need to really think about what we do. Well, we're going to close the session there. I think I'd just like to thank all the speakers for, for um, excellent session. Uh,